Um, the, as I said, the Virginia Foundation for the Humanities produces the Virginia Festival of the Book, and um, we encourage everyone to support the festival. You can do so by obtaining an envelope at the uh, Omni Hotel and providing a donation. Uh, it helps sustain the program and continues it on. Um, most of the programs are free of charge, and it does help with uh, con the continuance of this. You will all have a, uh, an evaluation form. Please do fill that out after the session is over. It's very helpful for future programs uh, of the festival. There will be a book sale. All three books will be available uh, at the end of the program. And um, just a reminder also that a portion of the sale of each of the book uh, goes into the Virginia Festival uh, of the Book program itself. The, um, the sessions are being recorded, so during the question and answer period, this is important because of the recording of the programs, please raise your hand and one of the volunteers of the festival will bring you a handheld microphone so your question can be heard uh, on tape or however else it's being broadcast. Um, this evening we have a, a wonderful program uh, that features um, uh, Jan K. Herman, uh, who is the author of The Lucky Few, The Fall of Saigon, and The Rescue Mission of the USS Kirk. And as I'm introducing these individuals, they, this, this will be the order of their presentations. Second to speak will be General Ira Hunt, Losing Vietnam, How America Abandoned South Est Southeast Asia. He's a retired uh, Major General, and I have the privilege of uh, moderating his last book here at the Book Festival. Uh, by the way, Jan's book, uh, Jan is a retired Chief Medical Historian of the U.S. Navy, and he has offered, uh, authored seven books related to military history. And then finally, Frank Leith Jones, the author of Blowtorch, Robert Comer, Vietnam, and American Cold War Strategy will uh, conclude today's uh, program. Um, he is a professor at the U.S. Army War College up at Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and holds the Eisenhower Chair of National Security. I think that's um, all of the uh, groundwork we need to cover, and with that, I would like, uh, please, for Jan to begin our program. Thank you. At first glance, the story of USS Kirk, The Lucky Few, the book that I'm speaking about, seems a little story. It seems almost insignificant. For 35 years, this story remained unknown and untold, and that may be for a very simple reason. It's a Vietnam story. When our most traumatic and divisive conflict since the Civil War ended in chaos, and some say shame, Americans wanted nothing more to do with Vietnam. It was a nightmare best forgotten. A little story, an insignificant one. On the contrary, this is a Vietnam story I think is very much worth telling. In the next few minutes, allow me to let you sample just a little piece of it. Lieutenant Bob Lemke wandered into USS Kirk Combat Information Center. Amid the many radar scopes was a large radar repeater that consolidated information from the other displays. One look at the repeater screen put everything into perspective. Each green blip was a ship of some sort, making it easy to quickly see the location of every craft on a master grid. But the screen image appeared odd. The shoreline was out of focus. Going topside to the flying bridge, he grabbed the large binoculars and scanned the brightening horizon. The mystery of the blurry radar screen instantly cleared up. Hundreds of boats were heading out to sea in Kirk's direction. As the distance closed, he noted every type of watercraft from small fishing vessel to rubber raft. The lieutenant was shocked to see a small wooden dugout with a man, woman, and two children clinging for dear life. As he recalled, on that dugout were all the family possessions, including a small motorbike. These people were simply paddling out to sea, hoping to get to the re rescue ships. The magnitude of a nation's final collapse suddenly became real and very personal for this young Navy lieutenant. For days prior to the fall of Saigon, the byproducts 
of that relentless conquest by the North Vietnamese Army were thousands of panicked refugees trying to flee the country in anything that would float. On that same Tuesday, the 438-foot destroyer escort, USS Kirk, was operating off the South, Viet uh, South Vietnamese coast near the port of Vong Tau. Overhead, large CH-53 and CH-46 helicopters began shuttling American and Vietnamese evacuees from Saigon. These Vietnamese were the people who had helped us during the war and whose lives were not going to be worth much once the North Vietnamese took Saigon. Just as suddenly, hordes of unknown contacts began fogging Kirk's radar screens again. South Vietnamese Army and Air Force UH-1 Hueys were following the large American helicopters back out to sea, and they were packed with fleeing refugees. Airman Donald Cox and the ship's chief engineer, Lieutenant Hugh Doyle, recognized what was happening. We knew an evac evacuation was going on, and with each helicopter that would pass us, we had an open deck. Doyle and many of the other crew members were caught up in the excitement and saw the possibilities. We never anticipated a helicopter landing on us, but we started talking about it. Wouldn't it be great to grab a helicopter? Wouldn't it be great to take part in this? Be careful what you wish for. In an attempt to advertise Kirk's hospitality, the ship's first-class storekeeper, who spoke rudimentary Vietnamese, began broadcasting on the air distress frequency. Ship 1087, the whole number of Kirk. Ship 1087, land here. 20 minutes later, Airman Gerald McClellan waved his first Huey onto Kirk's flight deck with a load of refugees. This seemingly brand new helicopter was the keeper, the trophy they would bring home. The following night, which should have been the 30th of April of 1975, Commander Paul Jacobs, the CO of the ship, received a cryptic message from the task force commander. He was ordered to dispatch the Kirk's motor whaleboat to pull alongside the USS Blue Ridge, and he was to take aboard a mysterious passenger. That passenger was a, na a man named Richard Armitage, a 30-year-old civilian. When he came aboard incongruously dressed, that is, for the South China Sea at that time of year, he was dressed in a, a sports coat, a tie, and he had a 45 automatic and a shoulder holster. And uh, Captain Jacobs said to him, I'm not used to having armed civilians come aboard my ship in the dead of night, upon which Armitage answered in a very gruff voice, I'm not used to coming aboard armed in the dead of night, but I've got a job to do. I work for the Secretary of Defense. Armitage then outlined what would be a secret mission for the Kirk. The remnants of the South Vietnamese Navy, about 32 ships in all, would gather at Khan San Island just off the South Vietnamese coast. Their job would be to rendezvous with these ships at dawn the following day and escort them across the South China Sea to safety at Subic Bay in the Philippines. Following morning, as the Kirk, uh, as the Kirk pulled into view of Kansan Island, the sun was just coming up. And what was evident all around them were the 32 ships they'd expected. But what they hadn't expected was what appeared to be a humanitarian disaster in the making. Lieutenant Hugh Doyle likened what he saw to a bunch of Hershey bars dropped on a hot summer sidewalk, and all of them crawling with ants. Kirk CO Paul Jacobs recalled the scene. Some of them were anchored, some were not, some were adrift. They were just loaded with people all the way up to the bridge. I estimated two to 3,000 people on one of those ships. I said, oh my god, this is going to be an insurmountable problem. How are we going to pull this off? Just how USS Kirk pulled off the rescue of an estimated 30,000 refugees aboard those 32 ships is the real story, the subject of my book, The Lucky Few. In 2009, I was completing a book entitled Navy Medicine in Vietnam, which told the story of my generation's war. The last chapter focused on the humanitarian task Navy medical personnel played in caring for the thousands of refugees who fled South Vietnam when that nation ceased to exist. To complete that last chapter, I first had to get the story.